Hello everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Sara Noshad and I'm the OBGYN tutor for Team Polaris. And as you're all aware, we're here to discuss recall session regarding OBG topics. So we've divided this into a few sessions and this is just going to be one of the many parts that we have to look forward to. So as you know, uh, exams are coming and we're here to try and make it easy for you. So these questions will cover the most high yield topics that are important that you must know. And we will just briefly go through them. So this is like a revision for you guys. And all of these topics are already covered with the Polaris uh, exam pack that's already running in the team, right? So if you're all ready, we'll just move on and we'll start with the class. So our first uh, topic is going to be on carcinoma cervix, okay? So carcinoma cervix, as you know, is a very, very important topic because there are lots of new advances coming. The staging keeps changing. The management has got new guidelines in it. So let's go into the questions first. So basically, most important of all. What are the causes of carcinoma cervix? Uh, so you are very aware that uh, we have many options given over here. So let's uh, brainstorm and try to figure out which ones are correct and which ones are not, right? So first let's start with uh, human papilloma virus. Obviously it is the most known common cause of CS cervix because human papilloma virus leads to the pre-malignant lesion that then leads to CS cervix. So that's why HPV screening or your pap smear testing or even your liquid-based cytology testing are all based on picking up the high-grade or high-risk uh, HPV strains. Early menarche and late menopause, which although are also associated with other cancers such as ovarian or even endometrial cancer, they are also seen to have an association with cervical cancer because of probable early sexual activities and unsafe sexual practices. So it's one thing to remember. Immunocompromised state, what do you think about this? So in immunocompromised state is actually also associated with increased uh, association with CS cervix because people who have immunocompromised state, like people who are living with AIDS, have a low immunity. So because of the low immunity, they're more prone to develop high risk, high grade HPV infections, which are more likely to be persistent and more likely to become the pre-malignant lesion. And hence again, lead to CS cervix. OCPs and progesterones are not really associated. Drug abuse is actually not really associated. Alcohol and smoking, yes, is associated with an increased chance of CS cervix. And obviously, as you've already mentioned, women with a pre-invasive lesion are more likely to have CS cervix. So moving on. What are the clinical features of CS cervix? So the most obvious and one of the telltale signs of carcinoma cervix or something that should make you uh, look at the patient more deeply and to see if they've got this is blood stain discharge. Okay, intermenstrual bleeding, postcoital bleeding. These are like telltale signs that you have to rule out a malignancy. Postmenopausal bleeding, excessive white discharge with offensive smell. Why? Because it's a malignancy in the cervix. That means it can get infected. Because of the infection, it can produce purulent discharge. So some people who are in remote areas do not have access to healthcare, may not even approach a doctor for bleeding. They will just come because of the foul smelling offensive discharge. Sometimes the CS cervix, because of its proximity to the bladder and the rectum, can infiltrate and get infected. So this can be another me mechanism of presentation. Ulcerative lesion that builds or touch, pelvic pain. Mass per abdomen is not really a typical presentation, but obviously we would not consider this as our, um, sorry, we would not consider this as one of our first options at the moment. However, you can uh, think about it as a differential in case you're talking about metastasis. But with just CS cervix as a typical presentation, I would not suggest that you collect this option as a correct. All right, let's go to the next slide. Our next question is, what are the differential diagnosis of CS cervix? Which of the following would you think could be a differential diagnosis? So coming to this, obviously uh, we do not expect reflux to be a, a differential diagnosis because that's not how CS cervix presents. However, cervical tuberculosis, very likely, because the appearance would also be as an exophytic mass. There will also be discharge present. It can also bleed on touch. And it's also very common in rural Indian population. Syphilitic ulcer, again, very possible, especially in people who have not been appropriately treated for STDs. Cervical ectropion can also manifest or look with symptoms similar to serious cervix because of the bleeding that can happen. 
products of conception are, are an incomplete abortion? Yes. I mean, but you would have to understand this would most likely be someone who's had an obstetric history. So someone who's come to you with history of pregnancy, test positive, underwent a uh, miscarriage procedure, either medically or surgically, and still coming to you bleeding. So that would sort of take you away from a cancer diagnosis. Fibroid polyp, yes, this would be one of our other differentials, especially in someone who's got a history of AUB. So, you know, this can also look like a cancer, but you know, it's a benign mass. So let's go on to our next question. So regarding this, what are the investigations of carcinoma surgeries? So let's go to answer this question in a stepwise manner. So obviously, the first thing that you would do is you want to examine the patient, right? So after you examine the patient, how do you confirm your diagnosis? So you would want to biopsy the lesion because with the biopsy of the lesion, you get a definitive histopathological confirmation of your problem. ELISA is not something done here because it's done uh, for uh, screening other infections, not required for CA cervix. Ultrasound, yes, you could use this. Why? Because you'd want to see probably the extent of the disease, yes. Magnetic resonance, yes, again, to stage the disease. PET, yes, if it's a very advanced metastatic disease. And cystoscopy, proctoscopy, sigmoidoscopy. So I would suggest that if you had to choose you had to limit your answers, then yeah, biopsy and cystoscopy, proctoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, very specific to the investigations for CS of X. But yes, my MRI, PET, ultrasound are also additional investigations. So remember, these are all your correct answers over here. We are very sure it is not ELISA. So how about this? Treatment of CS of X. So, you have treatment options that can even be pre-malignant or prophylactic treatment options and the proper therapeutic treatment options. Let's go through all the options over here. Improvement of general health. Yes. Why? Because improving the socioeconomic status will bring them in touch with routine healthcare screening. So pap smears or villi or VI, that is visual inspection with acetic acid, will be routinely done. So you would catch those pre-malignant lesions, that is the HPV-infected lesions. And that would reduce the burden of CSRX. Uh, if you're able to uh, correct the anemia malnutrition, you can prevent the patient's disease progression, reduce, if you improve their immunity, the tendency for the HPV infection to be persistent and not regress would reduce. Now, conization. What is conization? Now, in CSRX, you know you have stages of the disease, right? So when the disease is confined to the cervix and it's in an early stage, so if it's a microscopic or a smaller macroscopic, so conization is generally done for a 1A procedure where you have very small microscopic growth. So conization is therapeutic, meaning for a very early stage CA cervix, doing conization is the end of treatment. The patient doesn't need anything else, no chemotherapy, no radiation, and they're considered cancer-free. But you have to be very sure that your staging is correct. So conization is definitely an answer. What is Whipples? Does Whipples come here? No. So Whipples is actually one of the surgeries involving the pancreas. So it's not an answer. So we know what our uh, outlier is. It is not Whipples. So what is this? You have LEAP. You have loop ex electrosurgical excision procedure, which yes, again, is the same thing. It is also done for early stage cervical cancer. So you have microscopic and early macroscopic disease. Now, these three options are all for advanced diseases. So you have radical hysterectomy, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. Now, at this point, I want you to just revise the staging of CA cervix, okay? So you need to know in which stages of CA cervix, is it surgically manageable or is it radiation chemotherapy? So for all the cancers that you learn for all the other fields, you need to know what is the treatment of choice. So it will vary for for CA cervix, for CA ovary, for CA endometrium, for gestational lymphoblastic disease, each one have their different treatment of choice. So let's just go over that very briefly. For, C for gestational lymphoblastic disease, what is the treatment of choice? Is it chemotherapy, is it radiation therapy, or is it surgery? I'm talking generally for 90% of the cancers. So yeah, with gestational lymphoblastic disease, it's always going to be chemo because it's going to be methotrexy. Obviously, I'm not saying that radiation or surgery don't have a role. When it is advanced and metastatic, you can try anything because at that point of time, our main aim is palliation. Similarly, with ovarian cancers, what is your main treatment option? Your main treatment option with ovarian cancer is always surgery. If you're able to get everything out, the patient's response or uh, the patient's outcome is going to be better. 
yes, chemotherapy does have an important adjunctive role. Radiation for ovarian cancer does not really have any role. Meaning that again, the role is palliative. What about endometrial? With endometrial cancer, again, it is surgery. There is a role for radiation as adjunction. Chemo is only given when it's metastatic. So let's come back to our topic of CS cervix. With CS cervix, the main treatment depends on the stage. When it's an early stage, so when it's an early stage, you have the options of surgery because surgery is completely curative. But once the stage has gone beyond, once it's in the stage two, where it's involving the parametrium, involving the uterus, at that point of time, surgery is more likely to fail because you're going to have remnants in the parametrium. And at that point of time, if you do surgery, the patient is going to need recurrent procedures. So in those cases, there, radiation therapy with concurrent chemotherapy becomes the treatment option. So remember that for CS cervix, you need to know which one, which of these two options are, uh, are preferred. All right. So if you guys have any doubts, can you please uh, pause me or ask me questions? You're more than welcome. All right. So let's go to the next question. So now we're moving on to the next segment. Okay. And let's see. Now we have abnormal uterine bleeding. So in abnormal uterine bleeding, uh, do we have any students who would like to attempt this question with me? So what are the structural causes of abnormal uterine bleeding? So is there anyone who would like to take this question? If the team can point me out to who is available. Okay. Hi, Nithya. Okay. So Nithya said it's A, B, D, E. So A, B, D, E. Okay, Nithya, do you mind unmuting yourself? If that's okay. I, I want you to explain to me why you said it's A, B, D. So we can have an interactive discussion if that's all right. Okay, can, does anyone know what is the, the palm coin classification? If someone can just briefly tell me all those parts of palm coin, so then we can move on to the next topic. Okay, I guess everyone is shy. Okay, how about Darshini or Abdul? All right, fine. So you guys are all right, you're all correct. So as it is, as you mentioned it, it's polyp adenomyosis, leomyoma, malignancy. Can you tell me what are the other causes for abnormal uterine bleeding, the non-structural causes? What is the mnemonic that we use there commonly? If, yes, thank you, Abdul, that's it. Could you, could you just unmute yourself and tell me what each of those alphabets stand for? Abdul or Nitya, you guys know already everything over here. Yes, everyone seems a little bit shy at the first moment, I see. So no one has any doubts on this, right? We will move on. Okay, let's go to something more complex for you guys. Okay, how about this? Fine. So dysfunctional uterine bleeding or abnormal uterine bleeding is due to an imbalance seen between prostaglandins, the coagulation mechanism, right? So can you tell me amongst these five points, which one of them are not actually responsible for AUB. Yeah. So we have PGE2, we have endothelin, we have PGF2 alpha, formation of the platelet plug and fibrin seal. So do you guys think uh, PGE2 is, an, is the correct option? Do you think PGE2 is responsible for causing heavy bleeding? or is responsible for uh, the pain or dysmenorrhea? What do you guys think? Okay, let's go about the more easier options. How about endothelin? How about PGF2 alpha? Are these involved in dysmenorrhea and uh, heavy menstrual bleeding pathology? What do you think, Abdul or Nitya or Yuvaraj? Darshini, any inputs?
Okay, so basically, these two are the main mechanisms by which you have spasm that happens in the uterus, also responsible for abnormal uterine bleeding. So do you know which drug do we give that tackles these two, these, uh, two uh, prostaglandins over here, mainly, that we help with AUB as well? It's methanemic acid. Mephenemic acid is given for dysmenorrhea. It's also given for heavy menstrual bleeding, also given for abnormal uterine bleeding because it works at the chemical level of prostaglandin production. Formation of platelet plug, yes. Why? Because you remember coagulopathy, you told me. I think Abdul mentioned coagulopathy is one of the causes for AUB. So because of that, when the formation of platelet plug is defective, you're not going to have, you're going to have AUB. Similarly, fibrin seed, again, part of coagulopathy. PG2 as such is not really a main cause of dysfunctional bleeding. It can cause increased blood supply to the uterus, but it is not one of the pathologies involved. So our outlier over here is this. It's not PG2, okay? So we, let's go to the next question. Okay, how about this? Oligomenorrhea. Okay, what is oligomenorrhea? Can anyone unmute and tell me? Like what you guys, uh, what is your... Um, understanding of oligomenorrhea. So from the word itself, yes. Uh, not really delayed. Um, yeah, you could use the word delay because delayed, it depends on when you tell me delayed, I have a question back at you. How much delayed? Because what if I tell you someone's not had their cycles for like two months or six months? Doesn't the terminology change there? It's no longer oligomenorrhea. It becomes, it becomes amenorrhea. Right? Yeah. So correct. Nitya got it. It's decreased cycles. So, you know, when, when, when you're more specific with your answers, you don't give your examiners enough time to, you know, catch you there. So correct. So decreased cycles. Yes. Perfect Satish. Endocrine disorder. So you think decreased cycles means basically the flow is less and the, it's very infrequent, right? So I want, whenever you answer any question regarding to menstruation, always, always go from hypothalamic, pituitary, ovu ovarian, and endometrial axis, okay? So that way you're not going to miss all of the questions involved. So let's just go through all of this. So what is the first answer, oligomenorrhea? The A point is basically the definition, correct? So when we talk about hypothalamic, can you tell me from all the options given here, which all are hypothalamic causes of oligomenorrhea? Abdul, Nitya, Satish, you guys have an idea of hypothalamic causes. I think you guys already, what if he's already mentioned it sort of? But if you could just list out the options for me so I know, I know that you're understanding the definition properly. Do you think weight is possibly hypothalamic? Yes, no? So hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian, and uterine or endometrial, right? Okay, so age. Age is ovarian, okay? Let's go to another color. Weight, stress, right? And weight and stress are mainly your hypothalamic pituitary axis. What about endocrine disorders? Okay, so endocrine disorders, depending on where they're originating from, it could be hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian. Amongst all of these, which of the options doesn't fit, right? Amongst all of them, the only option that doesn't fit is an absence of menstruation because what does an absence of menstruation mean? An absence of menstruation could be one of two things. It could be amenorrhea or it could be menopause, both of which are not oligomenorrhea, right? So you got the difference. You just, you yourself have been able to answer the question because you've gone through what is oligomenorrhea, what are the causes of oligomenorrhea, and absence of menstruation is not fitting either of those uh, points. So let's go to the next question. Okay, so causes of metraagia. So metraagia is the older terminology for dysfunctional uterine bleeding or abnormal uterine bleeding. So again, our whole palm coin thing comes back into play over here. So from all of this, which do you think is not a cause or does not fit into our palm coin terminology? So let me write that down here for you. So, sorry, that out of space. Fine. So are any of, the, do any of the students want to take this question? It's very easy because you've already answered everything. We just need to see which one fits uh, the question and answer session here. Nitya, are you free to talk? Or Abdul, or Yuvraj? Everyone's still very shy. Okay, it's, uh, all right, let's go, to it, go through this together. So, Okay, causes of metraagia, obviously, this DUB is there because that fits your structural causes. 
CSF, so carcin cancers are there because it fits your neoplasms, right? Carinkle is there because that's also a non-malignant neoplasm. Ovulation bleeding, metal schmerz, yes, because it's an ovarian pathology. Breakthrough bleeding, IUCD, yes, because that's again a foreign body. Decubitus ulcer can be because query you're suspecting because of mass, or again, if it's not a cancer, you're suspecting that. Only thing which really doesn't clearly fit into this is tubectomy. Now, tubectomy uh, can cause sometimes spotting intermittently, immediately post surgery because of blood collecting, uh, but it is not a known cause of DUB. So the only non, no, the only thing from all of these options which is not a cause is your tubectomy. All right. So let's go on to the next question. Okay, treatment. So how about we do this? What are the treatment options for menorrhagia? So like we've already mentioned, you have your uh, palm coin as your causes of bleeding. Yeah. So menorrhagia most of the times is either because of most of the times are mainly structural causes. Sometimes can also be coagulopathy. So let's talk about how each of these options will help. Right. So we have oral contraceptive pills. Do you think they're useful for menorrhagia? So if someone has got prolonged irregular cycles, yes. So PCOD having menorrhagia, you could definitely consider having, giving them oral contraceptive pills because one, it will regulate the cycle, plus it reduces the number of days by effect reducing the amount of bleeding. Do you think pessary has a role in menorrhagia? Obviously not. So what, where is pessary actually being used? If any of the students could answer, where do you guys uh, know? That in of, in gynecology that we use commonly use give pessaries. So yes, exactly. Perfect. Very good, Nitya and your brother. It's prolapse. So pelvic organ prolapse, pessary is the option. So it's not here. What about hematinics? Hematinics uh, is used because one, it helps improve the hemoglobin. Two, anemia will worsen uh, bleeding. So yes, hematinics can be given to use treat menorrhagia. NACs, as I've already mentioned, methanemic acid, drug of choice for treating menorrhagia. How do they how do they work? Because they tackle endothelin and PGF2 alpha at the base level, and by stopping that, they reduce the spasm, help with vessel constriction, reduce pain, reduce blood loss. Progesterones and mirena. Do the are these used? Uh, Nitya or Yuvraj or Abdul, what do you guys think? Do you give uh, progesterone mirenas for heavy menstrual bleeding? What's your opinion on this? If you guys can let me know. Okay. How about this? I, I'll give you an option. I want someone to answer this for me. What is the treatment of choice of heavy menstrual bleeding Okay, when it's not concerning a major mass, like major fibroid or something, like small fibroids, less than five centimeters, or just uh, like adenomyosis? Okay, what is the treatment of choice? Is it myomectomy, hysterectomy, or is it mirena? From your understanding. What do you guys think? Because there's been a huge shift in the management of AUB of late, where you know everyone is more directed towards reducing sur unnecessary surgeries, and you know that has made a huge change in our management. Very good, Nitya. Brilliant. So Mirena is the drug of choice, especially when you have isolated heavy menstrual bleeding, and especially if the fibers are less than five centimeters, you still recommend it because it is very good. One, if it doesn't work, then you would consider surgical option. So yeah. Progesterones, mirena, myomectomy, hysterectomy. Again, mirena is the drug of choice. Progesterones would mean oral progesterones or injectable progesterone. So oral medoxyprogesterone, acetate, norexisterone, or injectable depo medoxyprogesterone. The problem with oral progesterones, can someone tell me what are what, what is the reason why women will not be compliant when taking oral hormones? You have an idea? You may have heard some patients in gynecopedia constantly complaining about it. So um, you're aware that there are women may experience some um, mood disorders during menstrual cycles, right? What do you call that? Nobody? Yes, EMS. So what is the cause of premenstrual syndrome? Can you tell me the main reason why some, why what, what hormone is causing PMS? Come on, if they're almost there, they're in the right uh, train of thought. Yes. So another way for you to know if someone's ovulating or not 
is that if they tell you they have PMS symptoms, it's most likely they've ovulated because only when you ovulate, do, do you have a corpus luteum? Does that produce progesterone? Do women develop all the PMS symptoms? Now, it doesn't mean that women who don't suffer from PMS don't ovulate, but I'm saying someone who's regularly been having PMS and suddenly does not have PMS, has irregular cycles, it's more likely that she's become anovulatory and is no longer ovulating. So that is why many women do not tolerate progesterone orally because of these side effects. That's why Mirina became the drug of choice because it bypasses all of these side effects. It gives local action and it is very effective. All right. Well done, Nithya. So now let's move on to the next cancer, gestational trophoblastic disease. From this question, classification of gestational trophoblastic disease. Can someone tell me what the answer is? Is it A? Uh, it does not include. It includes A, B, C, or D. Which one? Which are the correct answers over here? Nitya, if you're okay, you can unmute yourself or any of the students who are willing to answer this. There's no wrong answers here. We're all learning, and trust me, you'd rather be wrong with me than be wrong during an important exam. And you'd remember making a mistake and you know not do it the next time around. So is, uh, is benign GTD a classification? Is non-metastatic there? Is metastatic there? Anybody? So what does benign gestational trophoblastic disease mean? It's basically molar. It means you've got your complete mole or your partial mole, right? Non-metastatic is basically GTN confined to the uterus. Metastatic by the word itself means is GTN gone everywhere. This Sorry. Polymorphic terminology does not exist. Okay, so classification includes A, B, and C, does not include D. All right, we're clear here. Let's go on to the next question. So what are the risk factors for gestational trophoblastic disease? This is a very important, uh, as, as important CA cervix is, so is gestational trophoblastic disease because Indian population has a very high concentration of these cancers, especially South, South Indian population. So since you guys are, in, you know, are from in and around this area, you guys should be aware of the possibilities of getting these questions. So gestational trophoblastic disease. Is young maternal age a risk factor? Can someone please answer this for me? Yuvraj, Satish, Nitya, Abdul, Okay, so I have another way of asking you this. How about extremes of age? That means very young, very old. Both are risk factors for gestational trophoblastic disease. So yes, this is a factor. Vitamin A deficiency, what do you guys think? Yes, vitamin A deficiency is also a risk factor. Previous history of molar pregnancy. Does that increase the risk of getting molar pregnancy again or getting GTN again? What do you think, Nitya and Yuvraj? Are they possible risk factors? Yes, very, very smart. Thank you, Satish. How about smoking? Is smoking a risk factor? Yes. So even smoking is a risk factor. What about oral contraceptive pills? Yeah, this is wrong. Oral contraceptive pills is not a risk factor for gestational trophoblastic disease. Now, I want to ask you another question. So whenever, I'll tell you, I'll give you, a, what do you say, a bit of advice. When I learn something or when I'm trying to remember something or understand concepts about something, imagine I find a question like this, but one is not the answer for it. Try to link that ans not answer or the wrong answer with the actual question that you think it would have come with. So where do you think oral contraceptive pills is useful in cancers? Or which cancer is oral contraceptive pill actually associated with reducing the risk of that cancer incidence by 50% if it's used for more than 10 years? Do you guys know which cancer in gynecology is OCP is actually useful in? So it either is it ovarian, is it endometrial, is it cervical, is it gestational trophoblastic disease, or vulvar? Nobody, nobody is aware of this. 
I'm pretty sure you guys must must know because it's it's all the rage. Uh, well, actually, Yuvraj, endometrial CA, oral contraceptive is not protective uh, because endometrial CA, the mechanism of endometrial CA is endometrial hyperplasia, right? So endometrial hyperplasia happens why, Yuvraj? If you could, if you could unmute, I would love to hear your voice and briefly. Yeah, Nitya got it. So basically, see, Yuvraj, let's sort this out right here. So endometrial CA is because of endometrial hyperplasia. Do we agree? Yes, most of the times. Why does endometrial hyperplasia happen? What is the hormone imbalance that causes endometrial hyperplasia? Can someone tell me this? Which hormone? Which hormone excess is going to cause endometrial hyperplasia, is going to cause abnormal bleeding, and is going to manifest as endo, endo, endometrial cancer if it's not tackled appropriately with a mirena or progesterone? I'll give you one more hint there. Let's see who has answered this. I think Yuvraj has already mentioned this somewhere before. No, Satish has mentioned this. So Satish, tell me, endometrial hyperplasia, which condition is commonly associated with it if it's not properly tackled? It's a syndrome that has irregular cycles, right? A ultrasound finding and hirsutism or weight gain. Another clue. Yes, thank you, Nithya. So PCOD has estrogen excess. Because of estrogen excess, you get endometrial hyperplasia. Because of that, you get endometrial cancer. So that is why, uh, Yuvraj, you would not really say OC pills is treatment for endometrial cancer. Actually, if you wanted to think about it, progesterone is. Estrogen is not good over here. Versus what Nithya said, yes, OC pills helps in ovarian cancer. Nitya, do you know the reasoning behind why uh, OCPLs work in endometrial, in ovarian cancer? Has anybody heard about the uh, Fathala's uh, uh, theory of incessant ovulation? Right? So what happens is every time the, you, the ovary ovulates, you have like a small damage to the surface, right? And we're all, we all know that most of the ovarian cancers are surface epithelium, not, part, not medulla. They're all cortical cancers, right? If every ovulation, there's going to be one damage, 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 damage happening to the surface. This chronic damage could lead to cancer was one of Fathala's uh, theories. So because of that, that's where OCPs come because OCPs basically suppress ovulation. So if it suppresses ovulation and there is no ovulation ever happening, the ovaries are quiescent, the surface is not damaged, and theoretically, you've reduced the risk of cancer. So we've deviated. Let's go back to our GTD topic again. What about AB blood group? So AB blood group, anybody knows whether it's associated with an increased risk of gestational trophoblastic disease or not? These are one of the things you'd have to by heart because it's a genetic study. There's actually, I cannot really think of a way to make you understand the theory behind it because it's just a genetic correlation when they researched, they found out that there is a correlation between A and AB blood groups with gestational trophoblastic disease. Okay, so now let's go to the next question. Clinical features of gestational trophoblastic disease. So guys, can you please put your answers in the chat box and tell me, passage of grape-like vesicles per vagina, uterus larger than the gestational age, a doughy uterus, snowstorm appearance, seizures. Yes, Satish, it's like fastest fingers first. Yes, you're right. A, B, C, D are correct. E is not a typical presentation of gestational trophoblastic disease. Rest of these are very typical. Like the, when those words are said, the first differential that comes to your head is gestational trophoblastic disease. So uterus rises in the gestational age is because most of the times with molar pregnancy, because of the vesicles and the large lack of a fetal part and the rate of rapid growth, that you will find that the woman may present to you with severe nausea, vomiting at maybe eight weeks. And at eight weeks, you should really not be getting any uterus per abdomen. But when you examine her, you realize, oh, she's like 16 weeks pregnant already, but it's very soft. It feels like atta, you know, the atta that you make, it's doughy. Whereas, uh, does anybody know why it's called doughy consistency? What, what, what do we mean by doughy consistency? The reasoning behind it? So when you have a gravid uterus, you have liquor inside, it feels like a balloon. It's tense. Whereas with regards to molar pregnancy, you've just got mushy mass all inside. So it just feels like clay. Okay, so that's why it's called doughy consistent. 
So uh, you all were right. Everybody got this as a no-brainer, not seizures. So let's go to the next question. Okay, investigations to evaluate gestational trophoblastic disease. So don't even look at the options. Can you please tell me what you guys think are the investigations to evaluate? Or at least tell me the answers from this, from the question given over here. What would you routinely do? A, B, C, D, E. Okay, Suraj, uh, could you tell me why A would be an answer? Or I'm guessing you probably read it too fast. B tells you yes, that is definitely required. But is it only B tells you, Satish? What about the X-ray, the ultrasound, the blood count? Don't you think we should do all of that, right? B tells you definitely because you need B tells you first make your diagnosis whether it is actually GTN or not. It could even just be molar pregnancy, right? So without that, you can't make your diagnosis. Ultrasound because without an ultrasound, you could not really confirm what it was before doing the evacuation. Correct? This is actually uh, what do you say? Lavinia, why? Uh, Lavinia, could you unmute yourself and please uh, like discuss with me why fetal heartbeat for gestational rhoboblastic disease, dear? It's, it's good if we can clarify the doubts now, you know, so that, you know, we can all be on the same page because I want you to benefit from this. I don't want you to have to go back and read GTD again just to understand something we could have solved it like in two minutes talking over here. Yeah, Satish, you're right. Ultrasound, no sound appearance, perfect. That's exactly what it is. So, fetal Doppler, guys, not there, okay? Because, first of all, in complete moles, there is no fetus. In partial moles, you may have an associated uh, malformed fetus. If it's twins, then that's a different matter. But that Doppler is not used to diagnose a gestational domoblastic disease, okay? So, no Doppler. Ultrasound for the mass with ultrasound Doppler of the molar pregnancy, different thing completely. Not fetal Doppler. So, read the sentencing, okay? Not fetal Doppler. Ultrasound Doppler, I agree with you completely because, yeah, you want to see vascularity, you want to see invasion. What if they already have an invasive disease before they present itself with invasion, right? So, remember that. Next, chest x ray. Why would you want to do chest x ray? Because one of the first places gestational trophoblastic disease metastasizes to is the lungs, right? And it's part of the staging. It's like the first thing. That's why lungs metastasis is so common. That even if they have met to the lungs, it's not considered significant. It doesn't even go to stage, a uh, higher stage, right? So remember that. CBC, because obviously you want to plan this patient for chemo, she's probably bled torrentially. It's not necessary for your diagnosis, but it is part of the initial evaluation. Again, amniocentesis, not for GTD. Okay, I mean, and not at uh, at the level actually they're going to ask you. Amniocentesis for GTD is only done if you have a doubt that the person's a twin pregnancy and one is a molar pregnancy and one is a fetus and you don't know if this fetus is normal or not. This is too high level for you guys and you don't need to remember this. So not fetal Doppler, not amniocentesis, okay? Do we have any doubts on this? Because we can clarify it right now. Because I want you to remember this. Very, very straightforward. Gestational trophoblastic disease is a histopathology, is an ultrasound and beta HCG plus some assisting investigations for MET. So that's an X-ray and hemoglobin, all right? If you wanted to add one more point, you could even add thyroid function test because you all know they go through they go through thyroid toxicosis. They can have crisis. If you miss this and you don't treat it immediately, people can even just die because of the thyroid toxic state. So that is something to also remember. So how about this? What are the treatments for gestational trophoblastic disease? Could you guys tell me your options, please? What do you think are the answers here? Remember, we've already discussed this in our ovarian tumor uh, discussion. So what do you guys think? Is it uh, DNC, chemo, hysterectomy, Bagshaw's regime? What is that? DNC, yes, Satish. What about the other options? I want you to tell, because see, I need you guys to remember, these MCQs have changed. It's not just one right answer. All could be right. Two could be right, three could be right. So you really need to think and tell me what are all the options that you feel would fit. So DNC is fine. Yeah, we've agreed on that. So DNC, yes, because for molar pregnancy, we do not recommend medical abortion. Okay, once you have diagnosed a molar pregnancy, it is surgical evacuation for two reasons. One, 
you need a histopathology. Without a surgical evacuation, you don't get any sample to biopsy. Two, the possibility of bleeding and torrential bleeding and retained products of conception and uh, invasion, et cetera, is very high. So you don't want to leave that to chance, right? So that's why we do a DNC. How about the other options? What do you think, Satish? Chemo? Is there any role for gestational trophoblastic neoplasia chemotherapy? How about Lavanya? Or Suraj? Nitya? You guys have any answer? Darshini? Ah, everyone is very shy. Okay. Prophylactic chemotherapy. So basically, chemotherapy, there are certain criteria to give prophylactic chemotherapy. So prophylactic chemotherapy can be given, in, especially in countries where you have lack of follow-up or you have very high starting beta HCG values. It's not part of the routine, but yes, there is a role of giving prophylactic methotrexate to help stop the disease, especially if you're worried the patient will not turn up. Prophylactic hysterectomy, yes, it is also there. The RCOG does use this as one of the options. In case, again, people are not willing for follow-up, they have an already existing pathology in the uterus, like someone with a large fibroid who also has a molar pregnancy. They anyways are going to go have an hysterectomy for the fibroid. You might as well do that for this. But you have to remember to check a serum beta HCG after the hysterectomy because that does not mean you have taken off all the disease. What if it was already metastasized at the time of hysterectomy, right? So you can consider prophylactic, but you have to follow it up. And it's usually done with coexisting lesions. It is not the first treatment of choice. So please don't give it as your first answer. First answer was DNC, follow-up, and chemotherapy. That is what Backstraw's regime is. Backstraw's regime is basically the therapeutic chemotherapy given for gestational trophoblastic disease, where you give methotrexate, where you have the cycle of, of how you're giving methotrexate, right? So that is called Backstraw's regime. What about estrogen supplementation? Do you think this is the correct answer? For gestational trophoblastic disease or neoplasia, is there any role of estrogen supplementation? You're right, absolutely. There is no role. It has nothing to do with the disease prog progress or how the disease manifests or how it responds. So it is not there. So this is not a treatment option. So now we move on to another part of dynamics, stress urinary incontinence. I don't know about you guys, but I found this, very this topic very stressful as an MBBS student and even as a postgraduate for that matter. So let's see if I can make it easy for you. Our first question, what are the risk factors for stress urinary incontinence? Okay, come on guys. Can you tell me which of these options is not the risk factor? We'll make it easy. Is it weakness? Is it childbirth, menopause, trauma, obesity, smoking, diarrhea, prolapse? Which amongst these is not a risk factor? Even my chat box has gotten very silent. Nitya, if you're there, please tell me what do you think? Oh, brilliant, my dear. Thank you so much. Yes, diarrhea is not a risk factor for SUI, but can we discuss how the others are risk factors for SUI, if you would uh, allow me? Developmental weakness. What do you think? How does developmental weakness? cause stress urinary incontinence. What do you think, Nitya? Or Lavanya or Satish? Or Yuvraj? Anybody who's present, what do you guys think? Fistula as a cause for SUI. You mean developmental weakness is causing uh, the fistula, Nitya? If you could unmute yourself, I would love to hear your reasoning here. So we could discuss as to why developmental weakness is a cause for stress urinary incontinence. Fatima, if you could help with that, that would be great. What about, okay, Nitya, developmental weakness. So I would think probably that would point towards developmental weakness, meaning the entire perineal support is lax, right? So because of that, the person is prone for pelvic organ prolapse, even rectal prolapse. And obviously that means even anterior vaginal wall prolapse, which is going to cause stress urinary incontinence, okay? How about pregnancy and childbirth? How does pregnancy and childbirth will cause stress urinary incontinence? 
So we were talking about developmental weakness. Pregnancy childbirth is going to cause trauma, multiple micro trauma to the perineal body, to the perineal uh, supports, and that is going to cause stress during contents. Menopause, because of lack of estrogen, so whatever hormone was supporting the already damaged structures, even that's gone. Trauma following surgery. So similarly to pregnancy, any trauma in that area, like even episiotomies, right? Any surgical trauma, et cetera, can also cause weakness. Obesity, smoking. So why? Obesity, because of increased body mass index, the pressure on the bladder is very high. So the entire area becomes very lax. So that's why weight loss is actually a treatment for people who have a BMI of more than 30. Similarly, with smoking, now the thing with smoking is one is nicotine itself can have a bit of carcinogenic and can weaken collagen everywhere. Two, constant chronic cough. Constant coughing will increase the intra-abdominal pressure and cause weakening of the pelvic floor and again cause incontinence. Like Nitya has very clearly told, diarrhea is not a cause. And yes, prolapse is a cause of stress and incontinence. Similarly, all of these other factors are also causes of prolapse. Good job, dear. Let's go on to the next question. So, clinical features of stress and incontinence are, all right. Can, I, can you guys tell me which of these do you think are clinical features? Satish, Lavanya, anyone? Does anyone want to take this uh, question? It's pretty straightforward. There's no wrong answer here. Okay. So yes, perfect. F is the typical definition of stress urine incontinence. Perfect. All right. What about uh, the other patient's presentation, the history of the patient, right? So clinical, you just mentioned to me right now that what is the examination finding? But wouldn't, when you ask the patient's history, what about Paris postmenopausal obese women, right? Do you think that is a risk factor, Satish? Do you think that would be one of her clinical presentations when like the person who comes to you with SUI, wouldn't she be someone who fits into that category? She would be a Paris postmenopausal obese lady. Yes, perfect. Very good. She would have a history of childbirth. She may have had a history of genitourinary surgery, any chronic conditions, such as chronic constipation, pulmonary disease, any neurological disease, right? So that is something to remember. She will have small history of uh, urine loss, right? And she could be on certain medications which may be affecting her ability to control her avoiding mechanism. Pus discharge is not a cause, okay? Pus discharge is basically a person having an infection. So this is not a clinical feature. Good job, Satish. Now let's try this. Types of incontinence. Do you think all of these options are correct regarding types of incontinence? Because see, don't limit, uh, because I am an OBGYN tutor, don't limit your answers to just my field, right? What if this question just came to you as a part of general surgery or urogynecology or something like that, you know? So AB is correct, Satish. But what about overactive bladder? Does it also an overactive bladder? I'll tell you one thing. This is a very tricky thing, which even took me some time to understand. Urge incontinence is because of overactive bladder, all right? So it's actually the same thing. It's just they've labeled it differently. Similarly, detrusor overactivity will cause urge incontinence. Detrusor overactivity is actually overactive bladder, the same thing. So basically, stress is the cause of incontinence. Urge is basically a type of overactive bladder. What about neurological incontinence? Have you ever heard of something called overflow incontinence? You may have seen some people maybe in your like neuro rotations who have had uh, injuries, spinal injuries, etc. So they don't really have any bladder control. Obviously, most of those patients will be on catheters for that very purpose. But what happens is with overflow incontinence is there is no control. So they have no sensation, neither do they have the ability to void. So the bladder works reflexively. So once the bladder is filled with urine, right, at a certain point of time, it just voids. It's called overflow because it's reached its maximum capacity of storage. It just starts to dribble and leak. That's called overflow incontinence. So basically all of these are different types of incontinence. So remember, you, because I don't think during your exam that you're going to get questions that, yeah, this is, this is going to be OBS, this is going to be gynac, this is going to be medicine or surgery. It's all going to be a mix. 
group. So remember to give an open mic. So that will help you with your answers. Okay. How about this? So now a patient presents to you with incontinence. What would you do? What would be your first investigation? You have done your clinical examination. You have come to a diagnosis. Yes, this looks like stress urinary incontinence. It is not urge. It is not going to be overactive bladder. It is clearly stress. You asked the patient to cough and you noticed there was voiding. So Satish has told me D. Okay, good. Urodynamic study. But before urodynamic study, what would be the first thing you would do? She's in your OPD already. You would ask her, you want to just rule out uh, something very basic. Yeah, good, Mitya. You're thinking along my lines. Perfect. So you would want to have a midstream urine and a urine culture. You want to rule out UTI. Perfect. Because sometimes you do know, right, that dysuria, increased frequency, urgency, typical of UTI. So sometimes it can be mistaken. And again, women who have had some minor degree of prolapse when they have UTIs will have incontinence, right? So first things first, basic is always best. Do a urine routine. So we've done that. Then as, uh, sorry, so as Satish has mentioned, you do want to do a urodynamic study, yeah? So you would want to check, how about this post-void residual urine? What is the use of this? So with stress urinary incontinence, we are... Um, Okay, let's, let's think about the mechanism. So with stress urinary incontinence, most of the time what happens is this is your bladder's normal position, right? So every time you are voiding, the urine will be leaking out. However, when you have a bit of prolapse involved, every time you void, there will be some amount of urine that's still left back over here, right? So that is what we do by checking post-void residual urine. So post-void residual urine will give you two information. One, the person's bladder is not voiding effectively. Now, why it's not voiding effectively? You have to do your urodynamic study to see whether it's a bladder problem, whether it's a position problem, structural problem, urethral problem, all of that will only come from your urodynamic study, okay? So, like they said, urodynamics. Next, transvaginal sonography. This uh, is a little tricky. Actually, it could be done, it couldn't be done. I would justify that, yes, it is one of the things I want to do because you want to see for other problems. Like if there are occult pelvic masses, which you're not really getting. It's an obese patient. You really can't feel anything in the abdomen, but they come to you with stress. You would want to do an ultrasound just to see if there's any other cause, putting pressure on the bladder, causing them to void. So that is one thing. MRI, MRI, because if you're suspecting for like overflow incontinence, yes. PET scan, I would really not consider because PET scan is done purely from a malignant evaluation point of view. It really doesn't have any role in uh, urodynamics or uh, urogynecological conditions. So these are your answers. But remember, always go with the first options of midstream for a U rule out a UTI. Do an ultrasound to look for the bladder voiding capacity. Do a urodynamic study. Consider an ultrasound just to see if there's any other coexisting issues. Right? We've cleared this. Any doubts on this matter? Okay, so Satish and Nitya are clear on SUI. Good. So here. What are the treatment options for SUI? What do you guys think? Okay, I, I will ask you a question in another way. You have some medicines that you can give. Basically, you have your anticholinergic drugs. You have surgeries that you can do. You have devices that can be used or some injections. These are basically the four major treatment options for any form of urogynecological. Ah, duloxetin. Okay, so Satish knows a lot about this. Okay, I have a question for you, Satish. Who would you offer? Okay, between medication and surgery for SUI, pure stress incontinence, which is preferred? Is it medication or surgery? Any, any opinions? You want to unmute and discuss with me why you think, I mean, what, what is your reasoning behind um, the treatment options for SUI? Don't be shy. There is, you've already rolled your oxygen, so I'm pretty sure you know probably more about this than I did at your age. So nothing to be worried about. Okay. So I want you to take this one information. It took me a while to assimilate it. Regarding overactive bladder, that is urge incontinence and stress incontinence. 
Okay, two are two different things. Okay, remember, urge incontinence is either because of detrusor overactivity or because of inability to train, like in like because people have habituated themselves to not being able to control their urine. So sometimes with detrusor overactivity or urge incontinence, right? The treatment of choice is bladder training, where like you teach small children to keep voiding their urine again and again so that the bladder is always empty and they don't pee accidentally, one. Two, the type of food they take. So avoid caffeine, avoid smoking, avoid spicy food. And it is drug of choice is always anticholinergics. Okay, because urge incontinence responds perfectly to medication. Remember, S for stress, S for surgery. Pure stress urinary incontinence is a surgical condition, okay? Like prolapse, there is no medicine to treat a prolapse. A stress is because of a physical damage to the bladder and the urethral angle. This angle is lost. Because that angle is lost, there is no medicine that can correct it. So always remember, if you had to give something, meaning the person is physically fit, understands the surgery, wants the surgery, stress incontinence is always treated surgically. Surgeries can be many things. You can offer tapes, you can give them injections, you can give them suspension procedures, right? Tapes are uh, sort of going through some medical legal backlash because of mesh erosion, etc. It's beyond your level. But remember, surgery. Medicines like duloxetine, which Satish has mentioned brilliantly, it's given to people who are not medically fit. So elderly, you know, people who are having other problems like, you know, diabetes, heart disease, uh, obese comorbidities are there, right? You give it to those people and those who are not willing to accept the risks of surgery, like his failure, all right, or the complications of surgery. So remember this little tidbit, okay? Because it, it, it's a very, very, if you remember these two points, you're never going to miss the treatment options ever again. So Kegel's exercise, remember all urinary incontinence, you give Kegels. All prolapses, you give Kegels. Even if it's in higher grade, you still give it because there is always some minor benefit from physiotherapy. Diet control in obese patients, obviously, if they're obese, BMI more than 30, you could ask them to lose the weight because one, weight loss will improve the response to the surgery. Weight loss may even remove the need for surgery. Bladder training. Bladder training is more important for urge incontinence, but it also has a role in stress incontinence. <clears throat> now, progesterone and simple thalidic drugs. Okay, this has no role. Paraurethral implants. Yes, you could have paraurethral Botox injections. You could do bulking agents to help uh, cause spasm, to reduce the spasm of the sphincter, to help bulk the sphincter so as to prevent the leak. So sometimes, because of the bulking agent, patients may have difficulty with voiding and you have to teach them to catheterize. These are the surgeries that I mentioned. Okay. These are the surgical options for stress urinary incontinence. So Nithya, Satish, Yuvraj, do you guys have any doubt? Like, have you understood what we've been discussing so far about what is stress urinary incontinence, what is urge urinary incontinence, and what are the management options? So always remember stress, S for stress, S for surgery, all right? So let's move on. Pelvic organ prolapse, another part of the same spectrum. So in pelvic organ prolapse, let's get into this. So can someone tell me, please, what are the three levels of support in pelvic organ prolapse? If anyone can volunteer, would be grateful. No one? Oh, this is very sad. Okay. So you've got your round ligament, you've got your uterosacral, you've got your cardinal ligament, and you've got the fascia. Okay, can someone tell me which is level one support? Come on, Satish, Nithya. Even a text will do. No? Yuvraj, Navanya? Okay, so Cardinal, perfect. Thank you so much, Nithya. Yes, so this is a correct answer here. Cardinal, ligaments, and uterocycles are the level one supports. Can you please tell me what is the level two support here? Is this answer correct? Level two? So 
So basically, your uh, fascia, your fascias are part of your level two support system. Your level three support system is not the levator plate. And someone tell me what is the level three support system actually? Okay, so that's going to be a question. That's going to be like a homework for you guys. Yeah. Good. Okay, what about uh, this? It forms a hammock to rush the vagina and the white line. Yes, that is the pelvic diaphragm. Perfect. Good mix, yeah. Good job. So remember this, you need to know the levels of support for the for the uh, uterus because based on which support is lost, you can have pelvic organ prolapse, right? You can have pelvic organ prolapse at the level of the cervix, at the level of the uterus, at the level of the vagina. You would have to correct that defective region alone rather than having to cut everything and repair everything again, all right? So let's go to the next question. Okay, predisposing factors of pelvic organ prolapse. Again, very similar to your incontinence causes. So let's go through this briefly. Trauma, yes. Connective tissue disorders, yes. Spinal bifida, yes. Stress of parturition, which is basically trauma. Diabetes, no. Not that diabetes would cause it. Probably obesity, yes. So we would not consider diabetes as an answer. Increased intra-abdominal pressure. Yes, obesity, smoking, yes. So predisposing factors are all, that is A, B, C, D, F, and G. It is not E. Okay, any doubts in this my question? So this is exactly like what we've discussed in our stress urinary incontinence. Okay, fine. Let's move on. Okay, degrees of your trend prolapse, very important. So can someone tell me which are the correct degrees of uterine prolapse mentioned over here? Nita or Satish or Yuvraj? Because I can only see you guys, three guys over here at the moment in the chat. Yes. Anyone else wants to answer? You're more than welcome. Is the normal position this? Is this first degree? Is the second degree? Is this third? Is this procedential? Are these correctly defined over here? Okay. How about this? So, is the uterus at the level of the cervix at the level of the ischial spine? Is that the normal position of ischial of the uterus? So, let's draw. Perfect. Thank you so much. So that is also your zero level when you're doing a pop tube classification. Okay, so Nitya, can you tell me what is what degree of prolapse is this? Do you mean zero is somewhere here? Well, the cervix has descended, but it is still within the vagina. Satish, you're also more than welcome to answer. You can. Okay, dear. So, what about first degree? It's not yet out of the vagina. Sorry, my diagram was not clear. This is the vaginal introit. Okay, it's still within the vagina, but it's not yet out. So, when it is the, this is the normal level. First degree is where it's descended beyond the normal level, but it is still within the vagina. Okay, this is first. So, what you were thinking I had drawn was this. Let's do it again. You have the cervix outside, but the rest of the uterus is still within the vagina. Okay, this is second degree. Okay, third degree is this, where you've got uterus, cervix, everything outside. That is your third degree prolapse. Okay, now I want you guys to understand that. See, here there is a little wording change that they have done in the question so as to confuse you. Your normal deposition is correct, your first is correct, your second is correct. Now, third degree prolapse right, just means that the uterus, cervix, and body are outside, okay, that is the definition of third degree. Procedentia, definition of procedentia is complete eversion of the entire vagina. So how do you draw that is, so if this is the introitus, the entire vagina is out, 
you don't have to go above the fundus, but there is no more vaginal tissue left inside. So when you're doing a pelvic exam, you can feel the vaginal wall continue, the, uh, the mucocutaneous junction. You can actually feel it directly here and then everything else is outside. This is called a procedentia. So remember this differentiation, okay? Your zero, one, two, three, and procedentia because it's important with regards to management. Any doubts in this question? If you want, I can go over it again with you guys. Okay, so what are the symptoms of a pelvic organ prolapse? This is again very something very commonly you would see in the OPD. People would have, uh, could guys, someone give me the options that they think, like just answer in the chat box if you're too shy to talk to me. So is it A, B, C, D, E, F, G as well? And if you could reason with me, why do you think each one of these are the options? Okay. So, feeling of mass coming down. Yes? Do we all agree? That is definite. That is the definition of prolapse. Mass coming down for vagina, right? Aggravated straining, coughing, heavy, heavy work. So, yes, it is aggravated by that. That is one of the questions we ask in our history backache or dragging sensation. Remember, this is a very important telltale sign. Why do you think the backache happens? So you all told me about the uterosacrals. Uterosacrals are attached to the sacrum, lumbosacrum here. When initial prolapse is happening, there is a lumbosacral strain because the uterosacral is getting stretched as the uterus is coming down. So in early stages of prolapse, the uterosacral is still a little taut, like in in stage one and stage two, people have severe back pain. Once it's reached the stage of procedentia, the uterus are completely gone. They don't have any symptoms, actually. Besides the mass, they have nothing. They don't complain of pain, anything at all. So remember that back pain is actually a very typical symptom of early stage prolapse. Dyspareunia, obviously, because the uterus is coming in the way, so they will complain of coital difficulties. Urinary bowel symptoms, yes, because you, your questions when you ask for prolapse history are if they have any difficulty in voiding, do they have to push the mass back to void? Do they have to do manual defecation or do they have constipation as a risk factor, correct? Mass per abdomen does not fit here, okay? So this is not correct, okay? Now, again, mass per abdomen is not a symptom of pelvic organ prolapse. However, if you wanted to like, you know, discuss with me, yes, someone who's got a big abdominal mass putting pressure can cause it, but does not mean that pelvic organ prolapse will only arise with, with a clinical presentation of mass per abdomen. So that's a little bit of an outlier over here. Excessive discharge, yes, I would say probably you could see that, especially if they have something called a decubitus ulcer, because decubitus ulcer is one of the things we're very worried with prolapse. So this. Prophylaxis for pelvic organ prolapse. So prophylaxis means what would you do or what would you advise the patient when she's young, when she's old, to prevent her from developing prolapse? So you mentioned all the risk factors to me, right? You told me about multiple childbirth, uh, lack of inter-pregnancy interval, instrumental birth, right? Lack of rest, heavy lifting, chronic cough, smoking, obesity, right? You told me all of these reasons. Those are your answers. You tell them to not do that. That is your prevention. So prophylaxis. So what do you guys think? Mithya and Satish? What do you guys think are your answers over here? Which of these are correct? A, B, C, D, E, or F? Okay, so A, what do you guys think? Is antenatal physiotherapy, antenatal kegels, et cetera, would it be of use? I think yes, because one, Antenatal therapy will definitely help because with pregnancy, you're expecting damage. The pregnancy itself, because of the pressure of the gravid uterus, will cause a bit of damage and childbirth is going to cause damage. So the person already has a good perineal tone, good perineal body, damage is going to be less. It's very important. Do you think giving routine episiotomy or routine instrumental birth is going to help prevent prolapse? I, I don't think so. Because what happens is with any intervention, trauma, remember one of the risk factors was trauma, can cause weakening of the pelvic flow and that will cause damage. Even nerve damage can happen with forceps, can weaken the perineal muscles, can cause prolapse. So no, this is not a prophylaxis. How about postnatal exercises? Postnatal exercise physiotherapy? Yes. 
avoidance of heavy work? Yes, because heavy work will cause increased uh, increased intra-abdominal pressure without the necessary tone down below. So that will definitely increase the chance of prolapse. So you tell them to avoid heavy work, space the pregnancies, build up their muscle tone before they have the next pregnancy. Encouraging multiparity, no. Prophylactic hormone replacement therapy, no. See, hormone replacement therapy in menopausal women would reduce the risk of atrophy. However, you do not need to treat atrophy to prevent pelvic organ prolapse. Okay, person with pelvic organ prolapse is likely to have atrophy. I agree with you on that. Point. But doesn't mean that the treatment of atrophy will regress the prolapse. So those are two different things. Okay. Management options of pelvic organ prolapse. So what do you think are the answers over here? So Nithya, could you give it a go ahead, please? Estrogen replacement therapy as a management. It is for treatment of vaginal atrophy, yes, but yes, thank you, Nithya. So B C D E. What about F, Nithya? What is Father Girl's operation? Hmm. Okay. So very good. Thank you so much for responding. I agree with Kegels. I agree with Pessary. I agree with the Folkography. This is something I want you to remember. Read the sentence. Hysterectomy, not a treatment for prolapse. Why? Because, now see this. I'll show you the drawing. This is your the vagina. This is the prolapsed uterus, the lax vaginal wall. Okay? I will get rid of this uterus. But what am I left with? I am still left with a lax vaginal wall, which is going to become a vault prolapse. I have not treated the patient's prolapse because the patient's prolapse was because of physical defect. The uterus was an innocent bystander. The uterus was just there because of its existence and it was coming down because it had nothing supporting it up. Just because I removed the uterus doesn't mean there's nothing else that can't come. You have bowels that can still come, right? Even though you close the defect, the bowel can now become the reason for pressure to cause a void prolapse. So remember, hysterectomy is not a treatment of pelvic organ. If you told me hysterectomy plus this, paravaginal defect repair, anterior repair, yes. So remember, whenever you see your doctors writing in their notes, it's a vaginal hysterectomy plus pelvic floor repair. Never just a vaginal hysterectomy. That is not a treatment. Now, Nithya, what about father girls? You know what is father girls? So this is something I want you to think outside the box. Don't think about the prolapse patients you routinely see. Like you probably see a 60, 70 year old lady with pelvic organ prolapse. What if perfect Nithya? What if you see a young patient, a 30-year-old, a 25-year-old with, with prolapse? Now she's not complete in her family. One reason that she would want to retain her uterus to the stigma of losing your uterus, you lose lost your womanhood, etc. That is where the father girls comes. This is also like the Manchester repair, the father girls operation, right? These are surgeries where uterine preservation is done for a prolapse. So you what you do over here is either you would amputate the cervix, you would take these uterosacles that are attached over here, right? You would cut the sacles from their attachment and then you would bring them forward here to the anterior part of the cervix so that it tightens up the uterus and it pulls it up. That is a father girls operation, okay? So as, as we've corrected our answers, it is not estrogen replacement therapy and it is not vaginal abdominal hysterectomy. Estrogen replacement therapy will treat the atrophy, will not treat the prolapse, okay? So remember that. So I hope this is clear. So now we've come to one of our last set of discussions. This is ovarian tumor. So we've got a mix of cancer and gynac today. Okay, what is a functional ovarian? Can you guys tell me what are the correct options over here? Functional ovarian cyst. So Nithya, what do you think would be the answer here? Is it a fluid accumulation? Is it because of progesterone? Is it because, uh, is it asymptomatic? Does it have any other problem like dyspareunia, bleeding, malignant potential? Does it regress? What are your thoughts? So 
from a functional cis point of view, from the name itself, you realize it's not something which is A E. Okay, so you're saying it's A and you think E, e is correct? You think functional ovarian cysts have a high malignant potential? So basically, functional cysts are that they work. Okay, that means they have some amount of minor hormone projection. Ah, yes, perfect, Nithya. They are fluid collections and they regress spontaneous. Okay, correct, perfect. Plus, the other points are also there. See, they sometimes can be asymptomatic unless they have a rupture, etc. If the cyst is large enough, it can cause some amount of pelvic pain, dyspareunia. It can be caused because of hormonal pills that have been taken. Okay, and like you told, there is no malignant potential. Okay, so what you said is correct, but you can also extrapolate your answers to the other options as well. All right, so remember, it's not just one or two options. You would have to pick the most significantly closer answers that are there. But a very good, very good response. Okay, what now? Let's move this to the next kind of cyst that you have, corpus luteal cyst. Okay, can you tell me which cancer is associated with large theca lutean cysts, also called as corpus luteal cyst? I think we've already covered this in today's talk. Yes, thank you, Yuvraj. I see you're there. But you're not answering my questions, mm -hmm. but perfect. Theca luteal cyst, large corpus luteal cyst. Can you also tell me, Yuvraj, why they are associated in GTD? What is the cause or mechanism of creation of those large theca lutein cysts? Which, um, I would say, blood uh, level increases or hormone sort of is responsible for the uh, large theca lutein cysts. Yes, perfect, perfect, it's easy. So basically, as you all know, a corpus luteal cyst will be maintained by the HCG and HCG, because of the HCG, it will maintain the cyst, the cyst will produce progesterone, progesterone will maintain the pregnancy. This cycle goes on till the pregnancy is able to have its own placenta that can then independently survive without requirement of the corpus luteal cyst. So you brush. Also, you know that HCG is the cause for the severe vomiting of pregnancy. So all these three things are related. The corpus luteum is related to the HCG, related to the pregnancy, related to the nausea. So they are due to over... So a corpus luteal cyst, right, is due to an overactive uh, corpus luteum, right, that we agree on. Can you also tell me, Yuvraj, which are the other options in this uh, is uh, correct? Like, which of the options are correct in this? A, B, C, D, E, amongst them. Because you've got A. What do you think about B, C, D, and E? So we know that the corpus luteum is anyways a very vascular structure, right? Because it produces hormones and leaches that into blood. Hemorrhage within this can lead to the formation of your corpus luteal cyst. Commonly seen with ectopics or miscarriages, I would tell you no. Can you, Raj, think and tell me why this not commonly be seen with ectopics and threatened miscarriage? Connected with your already existing answer. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, perfect. Low HCG. Low HCG means these are failing pregnancies because of which their corpus luteum are never going to be supported because of which they're unlikely to have a corpus luteal cyst. Exactly why GTD has it. Cut section looks yellowish in color. I'm sure we all can agree on that, right? Okay, so we and uh, the USG appearance, <clears throat> USG appearance of spider web-like structure, et cetera, can cannot have a clot. So all of this is correct, except C and Yuvraj has given you the thought process behind why a corpus luteal cyst does not have that association. So factors affecting ovarian neoplasm. So what are the factors affecting ovarian neoplasm? So this is basically um, to tell you the malignant potential of an ovarian cancer. Like when you get the histopathology, when you are trying to look at the histopathology, like if you're looking at borderline tumors, basically this is more for borderline tumors. When you want to label the malignant potential, or you have surface epithelial tumors and you want to say why this one is more malignant than the other, like Y6 versus mucinous, clear cell versus serous, etc. So do you think mitotic count is important with regards to cancer? How about it, Yuvraj? What do you think? Yes. 
Yes. Thank you so much. Good. Stratification. Now, stratification basically means your cells follow an order, right? So when they are very disordered or they've got extremely multiple layers of abnormal cell growth, that is also looks abnormal to us. So stratification, yes, is involved with neoplasms. Cellular pleomorphism, yes. Nuclear atypical, atypical growth, yes. Increased solid areas. This, you know, is actually one of your ultrasound uh, things that you look for. There's something called an iota ultrasound classification for ovarian tumors in which the more solid area they have, the more vascularity they have, the more likely that ovarian mass on ultrasound itself looks malignant. Okay. Now, this is a little tricky thing because menopausal status as such does not label someone with an increased risk of malignancy. Now, you do see most ovarian cancers in women in the age of 60 to 65. I agree with you on that. But it doesn't mean just because they're menopause that all the ovarian tumors they have are cancerous because you know the incidence of ovarian cancer is not that much. It's just commonly seen in that age group. It's not that that age is the cause of cancer, right? So you remember the difference. Because you see, when I talk about menopausal state with endometrial cancer, it does matter. If a woman has a late menopause, her late menopause with excessive estrogen could have led her to have endometrial cancer, could increase her risk. Whereas the menopause, whether she's menopausal or not, on the ovarian cancer as such, is not going to affect its malignant potential. Okay? Right. How about this? Clinical features of ovarian tumors. This is a very important thing to remember because, sadly, ovarian tumors would manifest to us in an advanced stage, or already stage three. That means there is peritonea spread. Okay, you can, it's very difficult, and we are doing a lot of research and investigations to try and pick up ovarian tumors in stage one, but we have not reached that level yet. Okay, so let's look at the clinical features over here. Cachexia with eating cancer, we agree on that. Pitting edema, yes, because if there is any block, if there is invasion to your uh, into the IVC, into the venous drainage, you're going to have edema, you're going to have ascites, you're going to have fluid collection everywhere. Mass per abdomen, yes. Abdominal distension, yes. Again, because of, like I said, ascites. Cystic tense, duller percussion, yes, if it's a large ovarian mass. Movement of mass, uh, if the movement of mass as it moves with the cervix, this is typically actually supposed to be for something arising from the uterus or something arising from the cervix, okay? For an ovarian mass, as such, you would not get this kind of that. It moves with the cervix because any malignancy by nature of the malignancy is going to be hard. It's going to be tender. It's going to be irregular. It's going to be inherently deposited into the pouch of Douglas. So when you try to move the cervix, it's not going to move. It's going to be fixed to it hard. It's not a freely mobile mass. Like if you had a fibroid, a benign mass, otherwise. So imagine even if you had a benign ovarian tumor. Even a benign ovarian tumor, while you move the cervix, the mass would not move. It will still be there, right? So remember that differential. This is not part of the answer. And our last question for today, what are the investigations for ovarian tumors? So what all do you think would be the investigations that we would do? Last question, guys, come on. Let's, let's end it on a more interactive note. A, C1 ref, perfect. I agree with you on that. So can you tell me where is AFP and beta HCG done? In what kind of ovarian tumors? There's a class of ovarian tumors, right? And also can you tell me where is CA125 done now that you've said mentioned it? Yeah, good. So they're germ cell ovarian tumors. So CA125 is done in surface epithelial ovarian tumors. Good job. Someone told me ABD. Nitya, A, I agree with you. Yes, CT is the first diagnosis. X-ray MRI are also, assist, uh, are, uh, what do you say, part of it. Laparoscopy, laparotomy, yes. Correct. Uh, now, this cyst aspiration, I would not say is an investigation for an ovarian tumor. Why? Because you all know the new classification where you have an intact cyst, you have stage 1A, B, C. When you aspirate a cyst without knowing what it is, you are going to cause the fluid to leak outside. So you're going to increase the staging from 1A to 1C just because you wanted to biopsy it, not a way to diagnose. Now, cytology of aspirated fluid, yes. Now, if someone comes to you already in stage 3 cancer with ascites, you can just do cytology of the pouch of Douglas fluid because that's the most dependent area. So most of the malignant cells will collect there. 
do a cytology of the pouch of Douglas. So this is what I mean by pouch of Douglas. This is the uterus. This is the rectum. You have a lot of malignant cells collecting here. So you just put a needle here, aspirate these malignant cells. Cytology of aspirated fluid is a way to confirm, especially in advanced stage. If you don't want to subject them to very sick and you don't want to subject them to laparoscopy or laparotomy. Now, what I mean by this is advanced stage person coming to you with breathlessness to palliate their symptoms, you can give them chemo radiation. Okay, again, radiation is a little tricky with ovarian tumors because what all will you radiate? You can't radiate their entire abdomen. So chemotherapy. But whether to give chemotherapy, you need to have histopathology diagnosis, right? Now, you don't want to operate a person who's so sick just to know whether they have cancer or not. At that point, you can just do a minimal procedure of, cyto of cytology of the aspirated fluid. Do not go and aspirate an intact cyst for diagnosis. That is the worst thing that you can do in modern gynecology. Nobody does that. Serum ferritin? No. What do you guys think? Serum ferritin for ovarian cancer, any role? No, right? So yeah, so the two outliers we wouldn't do is cyst aspiration and serum test. So that brings us to the end of our session. I hope it was useful for you guys. I hope you learned something today. And I hope uh, even though no doubts were asked that at least whatever I said uh, will help you remember these topics going forward. And remember, these are all important topics. What we've covered, we've covered almost a good 70 to 80 percent of the important points and questions that you may get from them. But connect them to whatever else you read from them as you revise. And all of these topics are there with our exam series. And I'm sure you're all aware of that. So good luck. And I will see you guys in the next uh, recall session that we have scheduled. You have any doubts you want to discuss before we leave here? Oh, thank you, Nitya, for listening. Okay, so I will move this to Fatima or uh, Dr. Aishwarya. If anyone else, uh, if the, anyone ha doesn't have a doubt, then we will. Thank you so much, Satish, for listening. I appreciate your participation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all for joining. I hope uh, all have got some points for your exam coming up. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, dear.